Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Mirror of Intimacy webinar. Um, our topic is karma, and today is Monday, March 3rd, 2020. I think that's right. Yes, 2020. <laughs> um, I'm Dr. Alexandra Katahakis, and I'm happy to have you join me here today. So I thought this was a particularly uh, interesting topic and a fun topic to sort of play around with. And we'll start with Wayne Dyer's uh, quote today, which is, how people treat you is their karma, how you react is yours. And I'd like to pull that apart um, a little bit. So how people treat you is their karma. Karma is a Sanskrit word for deed um, or action. And our deeds and our actions create reactions from others. And in some ways of thinking, we're bound to play those out um, throughout our lives. And it's also thought in some Hindu traditions and other traditions that believe in reincarnation, um, that whatever we play out in a previous life that we don't clean up, we will play out again in this incarnation. Um, so this can happen when you feel um, misunderstood by people or you're in an argument with somebody and you don't understand your own actions or intentions or even where they're coming from. And that's because we are led predominantly by our unconscious. And our unconscious can be intergenerationally encoded, meaning that those unconscious processes might have been set up in infancy, or they may have been set up in our grandparents or great grandparents. And these transmissions occur through um, what we call attunement. So when the mother is attuning to her infant or their father in early childhood, um, you've heard me talk about this before, that if the mother is anxious or depressed, she's encoding that kind of anxiety and depression into the infant's burgeoning nervous system. And that encoding is an intergenerational transmission of trauma, essentially. So let's say um, you had a grandfather uh, that fought in World War II, and that person was traumatized, and that trauma led him to be very reactionary uh, with his children in a way where um, the mother was so, uh, as a little girl, was constantly nervous and constantly on edge and was biting her fingers all the time, or fingernails, rather, maybe her fingers too. Um, and then she has a baby, and that baby is you. And even though your mother has worked really hard at being calmer, perhaps, um, or she married somebody who was calmer that helps her calm down, um, you may still be a nail biter and not have any understanding of why you do. And that's because these are unconscious processes intergenerationally that are playing out inside your own body. So we can ascribe that to karma um, that the deeds and the actions of the grandfather live on in you. Um, and there is a saying, I think a biblical saying, that the sins of the father uh, live on in their children. Um, or we can think about it as what goes around comes around. Um, and that is sort of the second part of it, that if you are anxious and you bite your nails, uh, then you perpetrate your anxiety on other people. Uh, you're maybe impatient with them or short with them or... Um, you avoid them, uh, what you're going to get back, reflected back to you, is impatience, shortness, people that don't really want to be around you. And so that's how the intergenerational transmission of trauma and karma sort of link together. Um, and in fact, Carl Jung said that if you don't really straighten out the unconscious, if you don't bring the unconscious to the conscious, to your conscious awareness, we can very easily label what happens to us in our lives as fate. Um, that this was just my fate, that I was always going to be um, in accidents, or I was always going to be misunderstood, or I was always going to be um, you know, uh, sexually abused by people. And um, our fate can be shifted and changed when we start to understand that we are acting out these unconscious processes and um, we keep, you know, we, what we do unto others, they end up doing to us. And oftentimes we're not practicing, quote, the golden rule, we're practicing some bad rule that we learned um, as children. 
<clears throat> so um, I just laid out a lot of ideas there. And I want to remind you that if you have questions or you want to chime in or add to these thoughts or conversation to please do so uh, in the chat box and I will respond to them. So it's easy to get upset when life doesn't go our way. Um, but if life actually went the way of all of the spinning thoughts we have all day long and conflicting motives, we would really be a disaster. Um, so luckily, um, that sort of hamster wheel in our head of what's going on is something that we don't actually enact all the time. But karma is the cumulative impact of our actions that are being returned to us. So you can think about it sort of um, as a boomerang. Um, so this idea of what goes around comes around. Um, so what I do or the way I talk to people or the way I treat people or the way I hold people in consciousness will come back to me. So if I'm loving and kind, people will be loving and kind to me. If I'm mean or short, or even worse, you know, manipulative or diabolical or cruel, then cruel things will happen to me. Um, so <clears throat> let's say you have someone uh, in your family, perhaps a stepmother, who is the um, sort of archetypical cruel stepmother. Uh, she does evil things to the children in the household, um, or she um, tries to split the adult kids from their father. Um, and she's torturous to the grandchildren, but uh, the father doesn't know that any of that's going on. She's very sweet and saccharine on the surface um, and sort of creates this um, image of being good and kind and loving. But backstage, everyone knows that she's the wicked stepmother. And th this is an evil archetype in our culture. And it does play out many, many times when um, people get divorced, oftentimes men, and they choose women that aren't well, that have borderline personality disorders or are histrionic or mentally ill in some ways. And the men are duped for whatever reasons they need to be duped, sometimes because of their own issues, always because of their own issues, I would say. Um, but there's a whole world going on with their kids that they're not privy to, that they don't see or they don't get to know about. But their kids have to endure that to stay in relationship with the father. Um, and so that person who is so chronically evil and cruel and really... Um, sort of assaulting the family in emotional ways will get away for it sometimes for many, many years. But eventually it catches up to them. Eventually when the father's no longer around, whether he, they divorce or he passes away, something happens. Um, those kids no longer have reason to be in relationship with her. And she will suffer greatly because all of a sudden, no one's speaking to her again. Or worse yet, she does something to break the law and she ends up humiliating herself or possibly getting arrested. Um, and in so doing, her karma has come back around to haunt her. And so this is why I don't think people ever need to take revenge on anyone. Because when somebody is out of their integrity, when someone is behaving in ways that are unscrupulous or cruel or mean, it will always come back to haunt them. Um, there's a saying that people have to pay the piper or the chickens come home to roost. Um, and so all you have to do is patiently sit back and watch and wait and you will see that that person who is manipulative, cruel, um, vindictive, will always get their just desserts. And that's the most illustrative way I can point out to you of how karma works. And that's why that, there's that saying that karma is a bitch. Uh, because when it comes back to people, I think it comes back to them um, doubly horribly uh, related to what they've done. And so when someone says, when I think of karma, all I think of is the negative association around it. Is there anything positive that karma offers? And yes, and I was just going to get that also. Um, our good deeds play forward. Um, when we are kind to strangers, 
Um, I believe there is a universal knowing about all of this. The simple act of seeing that somebody's meter is about to expire and you have no idea who that person is, but you just drop a quarter in it to give them an extra, well, 15 minutes if you live in LA, an hour someplace else, um, <clears throat> because you're playing forward a good deed. You've just done something kind. And the chances of kindness having back coming back to you are 100%. And so you can make this experiment of saying um, that I'm going to extend myself in ways of being a good Samaritan. And I want you to be very careful about making that distinction versus being codependent and caretaking to other people. So it's not about doing things that compromise your own well-being, your own health, uh, the needs of your family, like giving your money away to homeless people and then you can't afford to feed your family. <coughs> Excuse me, that is not what we're talking about. Um, I'm talking about um, simple things that you can do on a daily basis, even if it's extending a smile to a friend or a stranger on the street. That extension is the kind of thing that you can do that will help you start to play these behaviors forward, um, holding the door for somebody, holding an elevator for someone, even though when you're in a rush and you're in a hurry and um, you don't want to do that. Um, so yielding to other people to make their lives a little bit easier are the simplest ways that you can start to experience sowing the seeds of positive karma for yourself that don't cost you anything. Sometimes we will uh, make a move that does cost us something. We are going to give something up in order for someone else to have a better experience. But I think those moments are best saved for the people in our lives we're closest to, um, who really are in need, who it may be that your sister is really sick and she can't take care of her baby. And so on this day, you're going to call in sick to work, which means that you're probably not going to get paid, but you're doing a good deed for your sister and more importantly, your niece or nephew. Um, and so you're going to take the hit for that in order to support your family. Now, if you were doing that all the time, that would be problematic because then you couldn't pay your bills, your job would be in jeopardy, and it's no longer about good karma. That becomes about codependent giving um, and codependently hurting yourself. So make sure you're making those distinctions between the two. So karma is not <clears throat> being judged by God or some other omniscient being or energy. It's not a punishment um, if something bad happens to you or good happens to you. Um, we have to recognize that um, our actions ripple in us in the way I was talking about psychologically, neurobiologically, sociologically, um, that we live in a context that is mostly um, psychologically constructed from our history and also the way our nervous systems are set up, but also socially constructed. I mean, everything in life is a social construction. This venue that we're sitting in right now is socially constructed or completely artificially constructed. We're plugged into um, a Wi-Fi signal. We're communicating through this electronic box. That's completely a social construction. There's nothing natural about that. Um, we're not just sitting at the beach watching the waves come crashing upon the shore. Um, and communing with the earth in a very specific way. No, we're, we're making this up. This is a subjective, constructive conversation that we're having in hopes of getting to some sort of truth. So you want to pay attention to how much of is of your own making, how much of it is from your family of origin, and how much of it is historical or ancestral driven. Um, and I've told my story before in writing um, you know, that the intergenerational trauma that my father suffered by way of the Nazis uh, occupying the island he grew up on lives in his body. It lived in his body and it was made manifest in the ways in which he parented or didn't parent for that matter. And those ways got encoded into my own nervous system and my own body and my own personality and things that I've had to work against my entire life. 
not to any fault of his, but because that's just the way he was. And so I've made it my business to undo those things because I don't want to be reactionary, short, um, terribly uh, dismissive or judgmental or think that my way is the only way. Um, I've really worked hard to be more curious, more open-minded, uh, more open-hearted than he could be because of his trauma. And so that's me sort of trying to write the action of karma in this lifetime for me, not because I hope to come back as some, you know, angel. Um, and in, I think, the Buddhist tradition, um, you can come back as a lesser or higher being. There's no guarantee about that. Um, if I do something bad in this life, I could come back as an ant or a snail. It doesn't mean I'm going to come back as some enlightened being. So I think what matters most are the good works that we do in this life. And so <clears throat> I would suggest that, you know, we all think about what are the right actions that we, th that we are engaged in today and every day and what kind of life do I want to be living? In what ways do I want to contribute to this national and international conversation we're having about what I think is the evolution of humanity? Well, I think it might be worth exploring um, what I just said about this, these conversations, these conversations that webinars and podcasts are allowing us to have that we've never been able to have before, um, where we're able to pull apart concepts and ideas in very elastic ways by diving deep into these ideas um, that aren't uh, mitigated by constrictions or restrictions of television or radio, uh, but that I can just sit here and riff on a topic and you're interested enough to sit there and listen and hopefully contribute back with your questions or your statements. Um, and as we do this, I think we're really struggling to invite an evolution of our human consciousness, which ultimately will change our karma. Um, so uh, how does karma develop conscious human consciousness is what someone uh, asks. Um, and I think it develops it because if I am constantly, I, I wish I could think of a concrete example or someone else could, but I'll, I'll give you an example that's kind of a horrific example. But um, I was talking to somebody about uh, a client recently, and this is not a new configuration of a person. This could be many, many young women, but a young woman who was 23, 24 years old, she was sexually molested repeatedly by a family member because typically that's how that happens. And by the time she was 18 or 19, she'd been raped. And I said, oh, that is the absolute setup for someone who gets raped, not once, but multiple times. Because when somebody is molested as a child, um, they have so many things happen in the brain and in the body where the brain disconnects from the body in order to survive something that horrific that that person is not walking around in a way that is present. She doesn't have um, self-awareness. She certainly doesn't have self-esteem or the ability internally to say, no, get away from me, or I don't like that, or you don't get to talk to me that way. She has no assertion because her no was stolen from her, literally raped out of her by that molestation. And so that leaves her unbelievably vulnerable to being raped, not once, twice, but over and over and over again, which is just horrific to think about, um, which is why someone like that needs a lot of support uh, in psychotherapy. Um, and so when she starts to have the awareness and, and before I say that, if we look back historically in someone's past like that, traditionally and classically, what we see is that there is intergenerational transmission of incest and rape in the family. And so she's just, you know, what's being done to her is what's been playing out for generations in this family. So it's not her fault. And it may not even be the fault of the person who did it to her, even though they should be held responsible for it. Because holding people responsible is about getting them to have awareness, to start to self-reflect, 
to say, yeah, what I did was wrong and bad and horrible, and the buck stops here. And that's how we start to develop human consciousness. When that young woman can see, oh my God, I can't even say no, or I'm so dissociated or checked out that I don't even see this coming. I should not date for a year. I shouldn't go out with anybody but my friends. I need to figure out ways to keep myself safe. So I need to go to therapy, read books, go to a 12-step program, like do everything in my power I can because I want to heal this. I don't want to transmit this to my child because if that young woman marries and has a baby, she will marry a guy that treats her poorly and who likely has a history of abuse himself. And that perpetration of intergenerational trauma will just go on and on and on. And so when we heal ourselves in the present moment, we start to have consciousness. And when we do that, we intervene on that karma. And that is a high calling, I think, in this lifetime, that that is what we're here to do. We're here to heal ourselves. And when we hear, heal ourselves, we actually heal our ancestors because we're able to forgive them because they were living in a larger context too. They did the best they could, even though they may have been cruel. Um, or um, even the evil stepmother I was talking about who is vicious and mean and gets her comeuppance, you can guarantee that that person was sexually abused or beat or emotionally abused in their childhood. Um, and so they had to endure a lot of heinous behavior for them to become so distorted. So we want to intervene on our own distortions. That's what we want to do. And to answer the question that someone writes is, uh, is there a way to speed up the karma? Well, you can speed up your healing. You can speed up this intervention um, by healing yourself. And when you heal yourself, um, Jung also said, if you want to change the world, you start by changing yourself. Um, and that's the quickest path to doing it. So these corrective experiences will start to affect our karma. It will start to affect um, the cause and effect in our own lives. Um, so I, I just remember seeing somebody in a parking garage once, and it was one of these small garages underground. It didn't have a lot of levels. I think there was only one level, actually. And so the valet had all these cars backed up and he had to wait for people to get out and move cars around and get to the next person and get the ticket and uh, there was a woman in front of me that got out of her car and she's just screaming at this valet like raging at this guy um, and i thought wow you know she is obviously her anxiety is through the roof she's probably late for an appointment in this building and she's blasting him with all of her anxiety and her rage. And this guy's sweating it in an underground parking garage. It's not his fault. The system, you could say the system just sucks. It's a bad system. Um, and all of us now are prey to it because we're waiting in line to get rid of our cars to go into this building. But even though my anxiety was also going up, and it would feel good to blow off steam and scream at someone. Screaming at that guy does nothing at all. It shoots her blood pressure up for sure. It makes her feel shame and bad afterwards. But what she's doing is creating that kind of hellish karma for herself because the story she tells herself is that parking sucks all the time. People don't know what they're doing. Um, all parking attendants or this guy's an idiot. I mean, you can just imagine the litany of negativity in that person's head. And so she walks through the world, seeing the world as stupid. She can never get what she wants or need. Um, in fact, um, it's just hostile and everybody is inept. Um, and that means that she is a victim. So she's walking through life as a victim and things are always being done to her. And guess what? She probably has really crappy experiences everywhere she goes because she's already primed internally to have her dukes up, to be defended, to expect the worst. And so when you expect the worst, that's what you get. When you expect the best, that's what you get in return. So these are the ways in which these things are insidious and how they play out in our lives and how we perpetrate um, the going around and coming around of them every day. All right, so when we look at to, uh, the daily healthy sex acts on March 11th for karma, and I don't wanna confuse anybody who's listening, today is Monday, March um, 
2nd, sorry, I think I said it was the 3rd earlier, but it's not, it's March 2nd. Um, uh, today's topic is, uh, March 2nd topic is magic, but today is, uh, we're talking about karma. Um, and the first step is to examine your actions. What actions have I taken today uh, that have been helpful? What actions do I want to take that would probably create duress for someone else? Um, and I'll tell you, the funniest and dumbest thing I can think of that happens every day is getting on the elevator to come up to the third floor of my office. If I'm in a hurry, um, I really want to push that button that makes the door close because I don't want anybody to stop on the second floor because I'm in a hurry. Um, and when I hear footsteps coming through the lobby, I'm always felt met with that question of do I push the close button or do I take a deep breath and wait? Because really, is two seconds going to make a difference in my lateness? And does it make a difference in that other person not being late for their appointment or whatever they happen to be doing in that building? So that's one place where I'm constantly shuttling back and forth with the best in me and the worst in me and saying, okay, what do I do now? Um, another place is always sort of the infernal shopping cart at the grocery store. Am I going to just leave it in front of my car and go, or am I going to walk it back to where it belongs? Um, and this is an ongoing, you know, way that I'm checking in with my own integrity all the time, too, because I've mentioned the shopping cart thing before. So pay attention to your own actions. And if you can, list five actions today um, and the energy and intentions that you gave them. Um, was that energy, were you screaming at the parking attendant? Um, or did you have a different experience with that? And were your actions, energies, and intentions aligned? Um, did you feel like you uh, did the right thing? Or did you do the right thing in the face of being angry? Like maybe you are enraged at the parking attendant, but you notice it, and so your action is to take a deep breath um, and to do your best to be at least polite when you get out of your car. And that would be a great example of how you're working with these internal processes yourself. Um, and realize that energy and intentions count as karmic actions. So if you're smiling at someone and you really want to, are flipping them off at the same time, that doesn't count. Um, or you're smiling at them and you're really enraged at them or you don't like them, people will know because that smile is fake on your face. And then there's another question. Uh, karma's always scared me. I'm currently in recovery and I feel so terrible about all the shameful, hurtful things that I've put my wife and family through. I'm working on healing and recovery now, but still feel uneasy about everything that has happened in the past. I want to work on myself and become a better person and create good karma. Well, I love that you asked that question. That's a beautiful question. And I don't want this to become some sort of woo-woo, hocus-pocus thing that, you know, karma's going to get you. Because I think that might have even been a Beatles song about instant karma. Uh, because I do think we can repair the wrongs that we've done. Um, I do believe in restitution in this life. And I think people that have created, you know, engaged in criminal acts um, that make amends, um, even that go to prison, can come out and be good citizens. Um, and so your amends are going to be really crucial for you to clean up the way that you've hurt your family through your addiction. Um, and that, of course, is an eighth and ninth step process. Um, and so that can be the way that you are living today, because as I've said before, and this is true, you know, in the program as well, that amends are not apologies. They're living, breathing, day-to-day -day acts. What are your behaviors today? How are you showing up today? What are the places that you can give service um, back to, or even make donations or contributions to organizations that can help some of the people that you perpetrated on? So there are many, many ways to um, say, I'm sorry um, that I was wrong and I want this world to be a better place. So I'm going to take actions to exemplify being a better human being. And I think that is a perfectly fine way to clean up the past, to clean up your karma going forward, um, and to make restitution uh, to the people in your lives. All right, so here's a clarification to the previous question. Um, if I've been abused and attract abusive people, it's confronting abusers a part of creating new karma. 
Um, well, I don't know about that because if you're confronting an abuser who can't hear it, who's not going to make any changes, I don't think that's useful. I think what's useful is getting out of the relationship um, and creating new karma is to heal yourself and not get in relationship with those kind of people anymore. Um, so you have to ask yourself, why do I keep attracting abusive people? Why is that still in my unconscious? Um, and why do I make it okay, justify, rationalize, minimize uh, the person I met? Because those are unconscious processes playing out. Um, so it's not the abuser's fault that you're letting them abuse you as an adult. Um, as a child, you don't have any agency over that. But as an adult, when we start to see that we're doing that, we've got to ask ourselves, why do I keep putting myself in harm's way? What about this do I like? And why am I so afraid to stop this? Because stopping it means you may have to go without you know, friends, uh, a lover, a boyfriend, a girlfriend for a year while you figure it out. And that means you're going to be up against your abject loneliness and pain and fear of abandonment um, and recognize that you'd rather choose somebody that was abusive than be alone. Um, and that is very, very telling. So if you were to give up the pattern of abuse, that means you've got to give it up across the board. You have to stop interacting uh, with people because you're clearly not choosing people that can take care of your heart. They're hurting you. Um, and so it's not, worth it's not worth confronting people who cannot change, who aren't interested in changing, who don't know what you're talking about. Um, it's only worth confronting people in our lives um, that we know can respond contingently, who can hear us, who can say, you know what, you're actually right about that. Um, I was short with you and I'm sorry about that. And I have a tendency to be short with you because um, sometimes I feel like you are taking too long and getting to the point and it's annoying to me and that's my issue. So there's a back and forth. And then the other person might say, well, you know what? I do, you know, repeat things oftentimes because I'm trying to get my thoughts clear. Um, and other people have told me that's annoying. So now we're in a dialogue about who we are and there's no real answer to that. It's just a dialogue about who we are and how can we um, be kind enough to each other and give each other some space to um, say, okay, I know that that's how my friend is. My girlfriend tends to repeat herself and I tend to get impatient with her, but I'm gonna take a deep breath and let her repeat herself a couple times this time. Um, and she's going to pay attention to not, you know, telling me over and over again how much she doesn't like this person. Um, and we're going to work this through. Uh, so I hope that gives you a clear kind of um, example of when it's useful to confront somebody and when it isn't. Okay, so any other thoughts or questions about this interesting topic of what goes around comes around? So I'm going to give you a few more uh, minutes to answer questions. Um, so remember that you can always invite right action to your life. You can always invite, you know, uh, difficulty into your life too, because there is cause and effect. Um, you can do it by, you know, picking a fight with somebody in traffic and see what bad things might happen to you. I don't recommend that because some people can be very, very hostile, but it's very easy to test that theory uh, in the negative. If you get in somebody's face and start yelling at them, they're going to yell back at you. Um, it's easier to um, test it in the positive. If you smile at someone, they'll generally smile back. If you say, have a nice day, they'll say, have a nice day back. Um, so realize that you can invite this right action into your life by being kind, by being considerate, um, by really looking out for your neighbor. And you might share daily challenges with a trusted ally or therapist or sponsor um, or request direction when you're unsure about where these lines are. Um, but let your intuition guide you and don't be afraid to say to somebody, you know what, let me think about that or let me get back to you or, um, gee, I really, um, I, I do need to sleep on that. Um, 
So don't, don't just react to whatever's going on in front of you because that reaction may not even be your own reaction. It may be your mother's reaction. That's how she always reacted to somebody. And you find yourself reacting in the same way and pushing people away. And you're like, oh my God, I'm just like my mother. And I want to stop doing that. <clears throat> so give yourself some space to say, I'm going to watch my reactivity. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to say to people, let me think about that. Let me get back to you. Um, so someone says, how do we clear up now a very hostile ex during a narcissistic divorce? How do I practice this healing now? Well, it seems to me <coughs> in situations like that, you have to have extremely good boundaries. And I mean extremely good, that those boundaries do not budge, um, that you stop playing the cat and mouse game that can be played out when divorces get really contentious and acrimonious because it feels good to <clears throat> or can in the moment to get back at the person or do something awful. Um, and, and I've had those reactions myself. And what I do is, you know, I sit with myself and amuse myself or I'll talk to a really good friend about like all the horrible things I want to do to that person that has hurt me. Um, and all the ways I want to retaliate that are really just kind of crazy that I wouldn't do, whether it is, you know, key their car or take out a billboard with their face on it or um, light their house on fire. I mean, these are all antisocial fantasies for sure. Um, but sometimes people that are narcissistic um, or borderline or histrionic, they evoke this kind of rageful fantasy in us. <coughs> Excuse me. So best to write the fantasies down, write them out so nobody can read them. Talk to a really good friend about them who knows that they're just fantasies and you're not taking them seriously and don't do any of them. Don't call the person, don't text them, don't give them anything back from you because once you do that, they will stop engaging with you and that gives you a space to start to heal and look forward and change your life. Uh, but boundaries are essential in that sort of situation. Um, and that's how you clear up your own part in the hostility um, and in the breakup of the relationship and in the divorce by going neutral, um, by taking all of your rage and upset elsewhere and really picking through it and asking yourself, why am I having such a strong reaction right now? That person's no longer in my life and yet they're still alive inside of me. Um, and so someone writes, uh, so karma is neither positive nor negative, it just is. And I would say, I would agree um, that we have the opportunity um, to clean things up in this lifetime for whatever we did in the past. If there is such a thing as reincarnation, I have no idea. Um, but certainly what I'm mostly interested in is this life because I don't know if there's an afterlife or a previous life. I just know for today what kind of life I want to live, uh, what kind of experiences I want to have. Um, and so I steer clear of situations uh, that are going to bring that kind of negativity in my life. And that goes for wanting to sue people or treat people poorly and all of that. That's just drama is what it is. And that kind of drama, we will eat you alive. It just does. It ages people it's because of the level of stress that it brings into our nervous systems. Okay, so finally, you might follow a spiritual path through study or attendance, either one. So studying uh, by reading about spirituality and karma or attending to your day-to-day -day matters. Um, but today, pick one problem in your life and practice the tools to help you realize what the next right action is. Um, so someone's asking if you can get a copy of the session so you can replay it. And the answer is yes. Um, you will find this webinar and every webinar um, on Mirror of Intimacy uh, on our YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com and you type in Center for Healthy Sex, one word, you will find all of our webinars there, my podcast, and the webinars of all the other sex experts um, that have been um, you know, on our channel uh, for Center for Healthy Sex for the last, I don't know, going on probably six years now. So for now, I hope you all um, have a really terrific day. 
um, and that you think about your karma and think about how you can change your karma just instantly, as the Beatles said, by walking out of your door and smiling, saying hello to a stranger, helping somebody hold a door open in the simplest way, and then think about the more complex relationships you have um, and the way that somebody talked about when it comes to making amends in your life or the ways that you've behaved badly uh, by being um, different than that going forward. So I hope you have a beautiful March as we usher in spring. I'm super excited about Daylight Savings Time um, and a new season approaching us. Spring is a time of great revival and possibility, uh, which is appropriate for this topic. And I look forward to seeing you again in April. So for now, take good care, and I look forward to seeing you then.